Our first words come from the Reverend Jan Richardson, a blessing for the year as a house on this World Refugee Sunday. Think of the year as a house, door flung wide in welcome, threshold swept in waiting, a gracious spaciousness opening and offering itself to you. Let it be blessed in every room. Let it be hallowed in every corner. Let every nook be a refuge and every object set to holy use. Let it be here that safety will rest. Let it be here that health will make its home. Let it be here that peace will show its face. Let it be here that love will find its way. Here let the weary come. Let the aching come. Let the lost ones come. Let those who sorrow come. Here, let them find rest. Let them find soothing. Let them find a place and let them find their delight. And may it be in this house of a year that the seasons will spin in beauty. And may it be in the turning days the time will spiral with joy. And may it be that this rooms will fill with ordinary grace and light spill from every window to welcome the strangers home. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Praise with Joy, the World's Creator. It's found in your online bulletin. Let us sing together as we are able. call to worship for the season of Pentecost can be found in your online bulletin. Holy Spirit, divine breath, wild winds of change. She comes to rattle all that cages, to provoke with prophecies and possibilities, to disrupt the quiet of complacency's routines. In her presence, all the earth trembles with anticipation of freedom. And a weary world is roused to hope. 
She awakens the senses to the nearest nearness of salvation. She is the power of God present among us. Come, Spirit, come. And dear friends, wherever you are this morning, however you are doing, whether you're watching with us live on Sunday morning or later today or in the week to come, may grace and peace be with you. And may this time of worship through song, story, scripture, and reflection be a blessing to you as you are a blessing to this online and dispersed gathering. We are live here this morning from the sanctuary of Knox Metropolitan United Church, an affirming ministry in the heart of downtown Regina on Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. This is a special service today on the 70th anniversary of World Refugee Sunday in which we ponder what it means to answer our call to be church in the context of refugee and migrant justice. And our thanks to the Knox Metropolitan United Church Refugee Committee, particularly the chair, Donna Nelson, for assisting in planning this service. And Donna will be here to offer an update from the Refugee Committee about the current state of our work, as well as offering our scripture readings. We are so thankful to Rena on the organ today and Karen, who is singing and then will be playing the piano for their gifts of music, voice, and song. And as always, a special thanks to Dan Coggins, our online greeter, who you'll meet in the comment section, offering and inviting times of conversation. Particularly, Dan also hosts our, our after-church Zoom coffee time, and a link will be shared later in the service. And our coffee time continues this conversation. Um, and please do join us. This, this week in particular, we have many folks representing different aspects of the refugee ministry, both here in the church, community sponsors, and others who are involved in this work, both connected to Knox Met and in the broader world. If we were in another time in which we could have more people involved in leadership of our service, more members of the Refugee Committee and folks who have been involved in refugee sponsorship with Knox Metropolitan United Church and others would be present to offer leadership. Today is also Father's Day and a happy day to all those who are celebrating fathers and father figures in your life. We also recognize that this day can be a day of grief thinking of beloved ones who are no longer with us, separated by life and death or space of distance and heart. And today can be a painful day, thinking about those to whom our relationships are strained, a source of challenge, or perhaps even if it is for the best non-existent. Wherever you are, in any of those and beyond, may you feel seen and held in whatever joy, grief, or pain you carry today, today and always. Many in the United Church of Canada are celebrating today Indigenous Day of Prayer and Knox Metropolitan United Church will mark this in our morning service next Sunday on June 27th. But we'd like to draw your attention to some opportunities. This evening, the Living Skies Regional Council is hosting an online service of lament entitled, What Have We Done? And this will be on Zoom and hopefully Dan could pop the link into our comment section. An advertisement for that service is on the Knox Met Facebook page. And tomorrow is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And as a community of faith who has committed to responding to and understanding the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we want to offer up some invitations to engage through donating, watching, and reading. And throughout the rest of today and into tomorrow, on our Facebook page, different places to make donations, like the United Church of Canada's Healing Fund or the Indian Residential School Survivors Fund, different things to watch, like Rise from Amnesia, which is about the Regina Indian Industrial School, a film that the United Church of Canada helped in the funding of the production. Or Reserve 107, another film about Indigenous land justice here in Saskatchewan. And we'll be offering you opportunities to read things, like the United Church of Canada's Apologies to Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, particularly Volume 4, a very timely thing to attend to. 
Volume 4 addresses the issues of missing children and unmarked graves. And we do well to remember that this subject, which has seemed for many of us brand new news, was identified many years ago and has been part of survivor testimony since these things have begun to be discussed in our nation. We'd invite you to prayerfully and with a full heart engage in some of these or other opportunities throughout the rest of today and into tomorrow. On Thursday, June 24th, we'll be offering a mid-year update prepared by the Knox Met Finance Committee. If you've been around Knox Metropolitan United Church for a while, or if you're still getting to know this community, we invite you to come and join this. This is going to be an, an informational and we hope encouraging and exciting meeting as we look at how this community of faith manages or stewards our financial and other resources in order to fulfill our mission and ministry, to be our call, to fulfill our call to be the church through music that moves the soul, conversations that matter, space for the spirit, and companions on the journey. This will be offered over Zoom, and I do hope that you'll join us. At this point, I'd like to welcome Donna Nelson, the chair of the Refugee Committee, to come and offer an update about the current state of the work of the Knox Metropolitan Refugee Committee. In September of 2016, the Legeshe family of nine arrived. Knox Met was responsible for their settlement and to provide one year of financial support. Many, many Knox Met people stepped up to help with the sponsorship, donating household items, helping with driving to appointments, and providing financial support. The Refugee Committee is currently working with co-sponsors in Regina to sponsor friends and families, family members. This is helpful when the newcomers arrive, as settlement is primarily undertaken by the co-sponsors with the support of our committee. Funds are also provided by the co-sponsors and we supplement these funds to meet the newcomers' requirements when they arrive. In December 2016, the Gebri Wahid family of six arrived. The two daughters were co-sponsors and they provided the translation and getting the family enrolled in school and in English. They also provided most of the financial and social settlement activities, but Knox met helped with furniture and paying rent on the newcomers' apartment. In December of that same year, 2016, Meles arrived. He is the son of Tekka, and Tekka provided the financial support with members of the Refugee Committee helping with settlement. In 2017, the board approved sponsorship of Emmanuel Abraham's two nephews. Nahom arrived in October 2019, and we helped with settlement and provided some financial support. Nahom reports that he is doing well, working part-time and taking English. Kiro Maryam arrived in April 2021, just two months ago. Emmanuel is covering all costs for this sponsorship. Kiro Maryam moved to Calgary in May and was married in, on June 12th. Both of these sponsorships were made difficult due to the pandemic, but both men are grateful to Knox Met for all the support we are able to provide. The board approved the sponsorship of Haymano, her husband and two children in 2018. They arrived in October 2019. The co-sponsor was the Virgin Mary Ethiopian Orthodox Church of Regina. Knox Met provided two months rent and the husband secured employment quite soon after arriving. They're now comfortable in Regina and have had another child. The board approved the sponsorship of Anna Lam in September 2018 and she arrived in February 2020 to live with her aunt who covered all settlement and financial costs. She was uh, employed shortly after arriving However, the pandemic interfered with that. She's back working again and studying English now. She would like to volunteer with the Refugee Committee and help in any way she can. Due to COVID, the Government of Canada has closed the border to everyone who is not ready to travel in March 2020. So we have four single sponsorships that the board approved to sponsor in the first quarter of 2018. Their applications were approved by IRCC in 2019 and we hope they will be able to travel as soon as the border opens. We have three singles and a family of four that the National Church has indicated will be on the allotment of spaces for this year. 
and we have five single sponsorships and seven families that we received board approval to sponsor and we are working with the co-sponsors to complete and submit the paperwork. KnoxMet provides some financial support for about a third of the sponsorships and the Refugee Committee does help with settlement. We also sign contracts with the co-sponsors that details what everyone's responsibilities are. The documents we submit to, sp to sponsor refugees are legal contracts and the rules are getting stricter as time goes on. There are many training sessions available to help with the details of sponsorship, but the job is quite onerous. So we have 20 applications at various stages in the process. To sponsor, to sponsor refugees, you need to raise enough money to cover their first year in Regina. The required funds assume that the refugees will be living independently and will need all new furniture. Noxmet helps by securing some furniture and by guaranteeing the funds if the co-sponsors cannot come up with the full amount. Most sponsorships do not need financing from Noxmet, but we do help some based on need and the risk to the refugees in their situation. Most of our sponsorships now come from the Eritrean community due to the relationships we have built with them. We are also currently helping bring a Syrian family to Regina. The head of the family, a widow, has a brother in Regina and he's unable to help provide financial support because he's sending money to this family in Lebanon until they have a durable solution. This family consists of a widow, her six dependent children, her married son, his wife and child. It's going to be a big undertaking. The wait times to sponsor refugees is many years, especially now during the pandemic. The co-sponsor approaches Knoxmet, we evaluate the request, if we decide to proceed, we seek approval from the Knoxmet board. Then the forms need to be filled out, and that is currently taking about a year due to the volume and the backlog. The forms are sent to the National Church, and they sit there for about a year. See, the government provides our National Church with only so many spots each year, and these are doled out to all sponsoring congregations across Canada. Once the National Church forwards the applications to IRCC, it is currently taking 41 months for a refugee in, in Lebanon, 30 months if the refugee is in Israel, or 24 months if they are in Sudan, and all of these times are subject to change. So it is a long life cycle. The Refugee Committee would like to thank the congregation of Naksmet for all of their support for this ministry. Many thanks to Donna for this informative report. As you can see, there is so much that is happening and, and so much work that goes in uh, to this important and, and vital ministry. And sometimes our service to beauty and to justice looks like standing in solidarity. Sometimes it looks like proclaiming good news and sometimes it looks like going through stacks and stacks of bureaucratic forms. We are thankful to those who do that good and hard work. In place of our normal prayer for confession and centering, this morning we have a migrant confession of faith adapted from the Reverend Dr. Louis, Jose Luis Casal. The Reverend Dr. Casal retired in 2019 from the role of Director of World Missions for the Presbyterian Church of the United States. Casal, who immigrated to the U.S. from Cuba, provoked the church to think expansively about the interconnection between faith and migrant justice. So our prayer today is his migrant's confession of faith or a migrant's creed. And those who are familiar with the Apostles' Creed might recognize the structure and cadence of this prayer. But hopefully this new emphasis will provide fruitful reflection. Some of the language may be different than that which we would often use. But I invite us to try it on and invite it to offer to us new possibilities. As you are comfortable, would you pray with me? I believe in a loving God who guided the people in exile and in exodus, the God of Joseph and Miriam in Egypt and the God of Daniel in Babylon, the God of foreigners and immigrants like Hagar and Ruth. I believe in Yeshua of Nazareth, a displaced Galilean born away from his people and his home who fled his country with his parents when his life was in danger. 
when he returned to his own country, he suffered under the oppression of Pontius Pilate, a servant of foreign power. Jesus was persecuted, beaten, tortured, and unjustly condemned to death. But on the third day, we proclaim Jesus risen, a vindication of the goodness of the earth over the machinations of empire. I believe in Hagia Sophia, Holy Spirit, the eternal immigrant among us, who speaks all languages, lives in all countries, and reunites all races. I believe that the church is called to be home, a foretaste of a world which longs to be home to all. I believe that the communion of saints begins when we embrace all God's people in their diversity. Let us take a moment for our own reflection, a time to touch our own longing for wholeness for the world we call home. Amen. And we are in this time of blessing the space between us. So we cannot pass the peace of Christ from one person to another in the same space, so we do so in the comments. And as we pass the peace on World Refugee Sunday, we recognize that that concept of peace, of safety, of wholeness, is so elusive personally and globally to so many. And so we say this with aspiration that all might find peace. Dear friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Our hymn is Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.
Please join me in the prayer for understanding. Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the words we now declare and ponder. In ancient stories, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. Amen. Our reading from the Christian scriptures today comes from the Gospel of Matthew and will be delivered in two parts. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Judeans? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, Sir, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Our responsive reading this morning is Psalm 9, and it's found on page 732 of Voices United. We will read responsively with everyone sharing and joining in the parts written for all and singing the refrain. give thanks to you God with my whole heart I will tell of all your marvelous deeds I will be glad and rejoice in you I will sing praise to your name O Most High are driven back they stumble and perish before you you have upheld the justice of my cause seated on your throne you have given righteous judgment you have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked you have blotted out their name forever enemies have perished you have made their cities a desolation the very memory of them has vanished you have ruled from eternity you have established your throne for judgment. You will judge the world with righteousness and deliver true justice to the peoples. You are a stronghold for the oppressed, a tower of strength in a time of trouble. Those who cherish your name will put their trust in you. For you, O oh God, have never failed those who seek you. Sing praises to the one who dwells in Zion. Proclaim to the peoples the deeds God has done. For the one who avenges blood has remembered and has not forgotten the cry of the poor. Among the peoples everywhere, God's deeds we will declare. Have pity on me, God. Consider the trouble I suffer from those who hate me. 
You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death, so that I may recount all of your praises within the gates of the city and rejoice in your saving help. The nations have fallen into a pit of their own making. In the net they laid in secret, their own feet are entangled. You have made yourself known, O God, and given judgment. The wicked are trapped in the work of their own hands. The wicked go down to the dead, all the nations that are heedless of God. The needy shall not always be forgotten. The hope of the poor shall not forever be in vain. Rise up, O God, do not let mere mortals prevail. Call the nations to account before you. Put them in fear, O God. Let the nations know that they are but human. And our reading from the Christian scriptures from the Gospel of Matthew. Now, after they had left, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my child. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that, they had, that he had learned from the Magi. Then was the fulfillment of what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Argelius was ruling over G Judea in place of the father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee, and there he made his home in a town called Nazareth. May God's blessing be upon these and all words spoken and pondered here this morning. Amen.
And I know he watches me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free And his eyes on the sparrow And I know he watches me Let not your heart be troubled His tender words I hear And resting on His goodness I lose all my doubt And I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to when hope within me dies I draw the closer to him from care he sets me free is I And I know he watches over me. Oh, as I is on the sparrow. And I know.
deep, deep thanks to Karen for that powerful uh, piece, so fitting to this morning and so many comments that we're hearing of how folks are so moved there. A migrant messiah in a world longing to be home. Reflections for Refugee Sunday. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. These are the words of the late Uruguayan writer and journalist Eduardo Galeno. It's a beautiful image. It echoes perhaps the beginnings of the first book of Moses, what we sometimes call Genesis. When the world was spoken, or perhaps listened, into being. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This carries in Hebrew a connotation of being filled to the brim with goodness, abundance. And if we can read this not as a theological argument for creationism, but a mythic foundation for a generous worldview, we can hear an echo. The world was born, yearning to be a home for everyone. But when this phrase is placed back into the full quote in which Galliano wrote it, there's a sadness. The full quote reads like this. The world, which is the private property of a few, suffers from amnesia. It is not an innocent amnesia. For the owners prefer not to remember that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The owners prefer not to remember the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. A preference for non-remembrance. This is an idea that has deep echoes in the Hebrew prophets, in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, and some of the more radical ideas of Paul of Tarsus. Don't forget, says Torah, that you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. This phrase is often repeated. Throughout the teachings in the early books of Moses, the Hebrew scriptures, or what we sometimes call the first or the Old Testament. You see, the descendants of Yaakov, of Jacob the God wrestler, the children of Leah and Rachel, but also the children of two women that the text itself prefers not to remember. Bilhah and Zilpha found themselves seeking sanctuary in Egypt amidst a deadly famine in their land. The people of Israel found a home when they were displaced. We should not forget Ibrahim sometimes called Abraham, who is referred, revered by Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Do not forget that under the tree of Marmah, Abraham showed hospitality to the divine, the divine who wandered hungry and thirsty on hot and dusty feet. Ibrahim set up a table of welcome in the cool of the shade, took water to cool the feet of three travelers, and brought forth curds and milk and the meat of a calf and then watched while weary ones ate. This is said in scripture to be the first theophany, the first time that God is encountered in human or fleshly form. And it's notable that this happens in the context of welcome, in the context of welcoming weary ones, feeding hungry ones, and tending to tired ones. Whenever you did this to one of these, you did so unto me, and the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. Our reading today from the Christian scriptures was plucked from its usual context. Perhaps you noticed. These are traditionally the readings for two different days, Epiphany and Childermas, although the narrative forms one whole. In recent years, these stories have been getting more and more attention as Magi from the East coming to meet the child who was born in Bethlehem, the child whose Hebrew name is Yeshua ben Miriam, whose Arabic or Islamic name is Isa ibim Maryam. In English, we sometimes refer to him as Jesus, the child of Mary. While the first part may be more common, it is the second part that we hear it is normally reserved for Childer Mass, also known as the Feast of the Holy Innocents. It falls on December 28th, which is not a day people commonly attend a midweek service. But it's a disturbing narrative, and it's, for obvious reasons, left out of most Christmas pageants. And that 
disturbing narrative has taken on a new resonance in the moment we find ourselves. A king trying to grasp to power orders that children be put to death. And so, out of fear, a family flees in the middle of the night, far from their home. Nativity scenes have begun over the past few years to appear in the lawns of certain churches in which the figures are found behind fences, sometimes with the child separated from their parents. It's often accompanied by a sign that says, Jesus was a refugee. Kelly Lattimore is an iconographer who grew up seeing blonde hair, blue-eyed depictions of Jesus. He now receives a lot of attention and, and often a decent amount of hate mail for icons that he creates that seek to bring contemporary issues of justice into the conversation with the ancient practice of writing icons. Interestingly, the term in iconography is that an icon is written, not painted. Recently, his work garnered a fair bit of attention with an icon called Mama, which was written following the murder of George Floyd and has since been installed in the Episcopal Church of Holy Communion in St. Louis, Missouri. And I think Dan's going to help me out by putting links to some of Latimer's work in the comments. So many of Latimer's icons <laughs> address issues of migrant justice. In 2008, Lattimore met a refugee family in Palestine in the West Bank who became the inspiration for an icon called Refugees, the Holy Family. A migrant family from the South seeking to cross into the U.S. became the inspiration for La Sagrada Familia and Mother of God, Protectress of the Oppressed, sees Mary and Child, but they are painted and written behind an interlocking chain fence, the child grasping at one of the links. And instead of the long flowing robe that she normally wears in traditional iconography or art, Mary is covered by one of those foil emergency blankets that are often given out in moments like those. Latimer's iconography, I believe, seeks to address the concept in Galliano's quote, that we have a tendency towards non-remembrance. And of course, the concept of refugees and migrants is a phenomenon of modernity because these things in our current context interact with the dynamic of nation states, of citizenship, of what Harsha Walia calls border imperialism and recognizing that the context of the ancient Near East, the ancient Mid-Asia, that displaced people in the text of the Christian and the Jewish traditions are not entirely politically the same thing, but the resonance remains. And so if we read our sacred text as a mirror to our world, can we read it without accepting its challenge to read these stories in light of the modern refugee crisis? The story of the Hebrew scriptures, we read famine that displaces not only the family of Jacob or Yaakov, who I've previously mentioned, but also Naomi and her children. They are forced to leave Cana and dwell in Moab in modern day Jordan. And it is there that Ruth will become, who will become the great grandmother of David. And she will become the second foreign born woman who will be named in the genealogy of Jesus. It is here in a foreign land that she becomes grafted in to this genealogy. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the military superpowers of Babylon and Assyria force mass migration, both through human captivity and also those who have to flee their homes in response to the devastation that is caused there. And throughout the Christian scriptures, the pressures of both global and local political strife amidst Roman colonialism is the constant background. We should always remember that the Christian scriptures themselves, that most of those texts are written during or immediately after the second Jewish and Roman war in which Jerusalem is destroyed and there is an ongoing diaspora of the Israelite people throughout the Mediterranean, not only 
does Holy Scripture refer again and again to displaced people. But so much of Scripture is written by displaced people. These are not just the unspoken context, but the events surrounding famine and hospitality, exile and return, and the search for safety, these are central. And hospitality and welcome become central to the divine action that we read in the text. The current emphasis on refugee and displaced people in the resonance with the holy family of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And by the way, if we wrestle their names out of our Anglo-centric perspective, perspective and instead call them Miriam, Yusuf, Isa or Maria, Jose, Jesus or Yosef, Miriam, Yeshua. Perhaps when we allow them to more closely reflect the names of the displaced people of today and this past century, we are challenged to remember anew how divinity enfleshed in our text seeks sanctuary again and again and again. While we remember that the Christian tradition centers the life and teaching of a Jewish Palestinian rabbi, we should also remember that in 1936, the director of immigration for the Canadian government, when he was asked about how many European Jews that Canada should welcome, he responded, none is too many. The owners prefer not to remember that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. Friends, it is not only the moral crisis of our world today that is reflected in our holy texts, but it is also the grace and the blessing and the transformative possibility of encounter. When Abraham, when Ibrahim welcomes weary travelers into the shade, when he cares for their bodily needs, it is not only they who are blessed, but in this moment, Abraham, Ibrahim, is able to step into the vocation of a blessed ancestor to multitudes. When Naomi and her sons travel to Moab, Moab, who are traditionally enemies of the Israelite people, they are welcomed. And when her sons tragically die, Ruth the Moabite, who is under no kinship obligation to care for the aging Naomi, does so anyways and she herself becomes displaced willingly to follow her beloved Naomi back to Israel. The travelers on the road from Nazareth to Bethlehem, who were displaced by Emperor Augustus' declaration of a census when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria, took it upon themselves to care for the expectant mother in their midst. And as I like to remind us at Christmas time, that stable in which Jesus was born, well, in Palestinian archaeology, that wouldn't be a shed out back. No one has that much space in their homes. A stable is the part of the family home where the beloved animals would have stayed. This means it's the family room, not the guest house. The family room. The biblical vision of hospitality is not one of paternalistic charity, but one of giving and receiving hospitality of mutual transformation, and in fact, if we will, salvation. Salvation from the humanity eroding indifference to suffering. Salvation from stale uniformity and entrance into a vocation of wondrous diversity, bringing in intertwining gifts. In our post-worship coffee time, which I hope you'll join, we'll hear stories from folks who have been involved in refugee sponsorship, both within the church and the community and folks who are or have worked with Knox Metz Refugee Committee. Today is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations declaring June 20th to be World Refugee Day. Today, the Regina Open Door Society has set up an outdoor display on the west side of the Wiscana Lake Walking Trail. It can be enjoyed following appropriate COVID precautions. And it offers both information about refugee sponsorship, but also stories of individual experiences. Stories of deep resilience, dignity, and courage shown amidst some of the most horrific circumstances imaginable. The 2020 Refugee Reality Report noted that 79.5 million people have been forced to flee their homes because of persecution, war, and or violation of human rights. 11 million more people were uprooted in 2019. 30,000 people every single day. 
according to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. At the end of 2019, there were 45.7 million internally displaced people and 26 million refugees in the world. 48% of the world's refugees are further marginalized. They're women and girls. And the growth of queer and trans refugees displaced because of violence or legislation continues to outpace research in this area. 50% of the world's refugees are under 18 years old. And 85% of the world's refugees are hosted by countries in the global south, themselves struggling amidst colonial past and neoliberal capitalism. And so on this, the 70th anniversary of World Refugee Day, may we remember the migrant God of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. May we remember both a legacy of compassionate welcome, but also those moments in which closed hearts and closed borders have led to tragic ends. May we remember the children of Yaakov, the children of Leah, Rachel, Bilha, and Zilpha. May we remember Ruth, who beget Obed, who beget David. May we remember the Holy Family fleeing from the impotent yet deadly violence of Herod. May we remember Ibrahim, Abraham, who opened his tent to three strangers and found that in so doing he welcomed the divine. May we remember that this world was born yearning to be a home for everyone, that there are 26 million human beings, each bearing the divine image, longing to find sanctuary. May we remember we are not alone. As we are able and comfortable, let us join with the, a new creed of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is found in your online bulletin. Make us servants of your peace.
we live abundant lives, blessed with so much. We offer what we can for God's dreams, including those which are lived out through our church. And so bountiful God, accept our gifts, our seeds of hope that we plant for the healing of the world. May the harvest be plentiful. O oh God, we pray. Our offerings that support the ministry of Knox Metropolitan United Church can be made through methods mentioned in the comments, the United Church PAR program, Canada Helps, or e-transfer. Particularly this week, we think of how we might highlight opportunities to participate in the Refugee Resettlement Program through a donation to Knox Metropolitan United Church's Refugee Fund or to one of our community partners who are fundraising for their own sponsorships. As we come to our time of prayers for community, we begin with silence in which we name our own prayers for ourselves, the people that we love, the communities we are a part of, and the world we share. In silence, let us pray. O God of love, hear our prayer. Today we pray for fathers of any sorts, those who are father figures among us and in our lives. We also pray for those who are grieving fathers, for those who feel estranged from, hurt by, or full of longing for the father in their life. O oh God of love, hear our prayer. With Susan, we rejoice for her son-in-law, Jim, and pray and give thanks for continued healing. O oh God of love, hear our prayer. As the Living Skies Regional Council gathers tonight for a service of lament, thinking about our role as the United Church of Canada in residential schools and ongoing colonialism. And as we prepare to engage with our gifts, our hearts and our minds in National Indigenous Peoples Day tomorrow, we pray for our open hearts and minds. God of love, hear our prayer. And we offer a prayer for migrants written by the Interfaith Worker Justice Network. O God of the earth that yearns to be home, help us to see one another through eyes enlightened by understanding and compassion. Help us listen to the voice of all our siblings and our kin throughout the world with respect and attention. Open our ears to the cries of they who have, denied, who have been denied their rights and their dignity and empower us to be instruments of peace and justice for all. Gracious God, you who guided Naomi and her family back or in her family to look for bread in Moab, a foreign land, protect the women everywhere who have to leave behind their homes and homelands so that their families can survive. May those who are escaping the ravages of war find shelter and sustenance. May the land in which they seek refuge welcome them and treat them with hospitality. May those who are seeking to stop the threats of violence against them find a peaceful and healing place. Help them to hold on to their hope for a new beginning. And may those who are fleeing from famines that starve them and their children find relief from their painful and debilitating hunger. May they find both bread for their journey and for their bodies. You who guided Ruth to go to the promised land, grant that like her, women may be lifted from the fields where they harvest to be part of royal lineage. And grant that we who are the spiritual descendants of those of old who were told that the holiest trinity is made of the widow, the orphan, and the migrant, may we be given the courage to see your face, your real presence, in the faces of those who have the greatest need. So we pray in the way of Yeshua ben Miriam, of Isa ibn Miriam, 
of Jesus of Nazareth. For as a child turns to her mother, we turn to God and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, we are welcomed in peace and we are sent forth into this world to love and to serve. Our deep thanks for all who have been involved in this service and a reminder to join with the Knox Met Refugee Committee, members of community partnerships and others in our online coffee. Before we do that, our closing hymn is found in your online bulletin. Go forth for God. colonialism shapes and distorts imagination, God provides stepping stones of liberation. May we see ourselves for the wild flowers we are, beautiful, singular, collective, beloved. And as we go, may the breath of life bless our undoing and our reclaiming, that we may flourish into community where holy belonging is accessible to all. Thank you.